Good evening and welcome here tonight to this session, uh, which is going to be brought to you by the CEE Bill Alliance. The event is going to be live streamed as well as recorded, and we've got some fantastic speakers lined up for you tonight. Please, as we're going through, please send us your questions, which you can put either in the chat box or onto the various social media platforms that we're connected with. Now, the speakers that we've got, um, and they'll introduce themselves more when we get to them, but just very briefly, we are Caroline Lucas, the MP, Tim Jackson, Director for the Centre of Understanding Sustainability, Kate Rayworth, the author of the hugely influential Donut Economics and now an advisor to the government of Amsterdam, mm -hmm. and Kimi Naidu, who was until very recently the Secretary General of Amnesty International. Now, just a few words from me. Uh, my name is Rosie Boycott. I'm a crossbench peer, and I also sit as one of the founding members and on the steering group of Peers for the Planet, which we founded about a year ago with the very express intention of trying to get climate considerations into as much legislation as possible. So far, we have managed to get climate considerations into pensions bills, so all big pension decisions have to think about what their climate impact is going to be. We have about 120 members and just from listening and knowing and being around, we have, we've moved the dialogue. Now, have we moved any of the laws? That's another case in point. This is really one of the reasons, main reason as far as I'm concerned, why I'm here tonight and why I think everyone else is here tonight because we're certainly going too slowly. And I'm always very amazed at the moment that the world of finance is moving much, much quicker than the governments because they can see that so much of what they're investing in is in fact going to be a stranded asset in a few years time. And that if you made a 10 year plan, which any sensible business and you'd think government would too, an awful lot of the things that they have their money in are not going to be working. And the same is true of the government. So we really need bills like this, which will garner support, push people into understanding the emergencies and hopefully get through. Because it, we are just literally this afternoon, we were wrapping up parts of the agriculture bill. And even though with agriculture, we have now got a new system of par farm payments, which has divorced us from the common agricultural policy, which just paid for literally owning land. Now we have a system called ELMS or environmental land management, which does aim to reward farmers for, so to speak, unprofitable things like keeping your hedgerows and your soil good. But the pace of change is slow. The amount of money that's pinned to this is extremely uncertain and certainly just hazarding a guess at the kind of pressures that are going to be on the treasury in the coming months. I don't know how much money is actually going to get through to farmers. Then of course we're in the trade bill and we're looking to keep uh, the same standards that we have and not enter free trade agreements. All these things are not certain. They are a fight. And you know, we I feel often that you're, fighting around the margins, literally, while it's not Rome that's burning, but California is burning and Australia is burning. And the need now for governments to move forward is so big. The, uh, the CCA, the Climate Change Act, with its target of net zero by 2050 is sort of fine, but also not fine at all, because without a doubt, we have to try to get to 50% by 2030 if we to have realistic hope of keeping us to 1.5 degrees. It's again one of these things that you can make decisions today that you actually don't need to act on today. And again, this is why we are very supportive of this bill and would like to help do anything we can to further its passage, because we don't actually have the time to think about something that's going to happen um, in 10 years time. We really don't have it. Um, so the questions we're going to be answering tonight are things like, you know, can, can the CEE reboot the legislation with the best science alongside it? I think that's enough for me. Um, I'm going to now pass over to our first speaker, who I think needs very little introduction to all of you here tonight. So please welcome Caroline Lucas. Thank you so much, Rosie, and thanks to everyone for, for being here tonight. Um, my name is Caroline Lucas. I'm the uh, Green Party MP representing Brighton Pavilion. 
Um, and it is great that you're all here. And after the news from the US this weekend, it feels as if perhaps we're at the start of a, a more hopeful week for our planet. The subject could scarcely be more, more timely. Um, you will know that the year is on course, this year is on course to be the hottest on record. 16 of the 17 hottest years have taken place since 2000. We've got record fires raging in the Amazon, the US, ice caps in Greenland melting at a terrifying pace and Storm Etta has wreaked havoc and unimaginable tragedy in Central America. At the same time, a UN report last year set out the grim facts on nature and biodiversity. One million animal and plant species are now threatened with extinction, many within just decades. So essentially, the background to this bill is that every warning light on the dashboard is flashing red. And in terms of a response to that, well, the UK is due to host COP26, the gathering of signatories to the UN Climate Agreement, postponed now because of COVID until next year. But it is just worth remembering when we're considering that UN process that even if all the pledges were met that were made at the last major conference of parties in Paris five years ago, even if they were all met, which is a big ask, we would still be on track globally for over three degrees of warming. Now that's double the threshold of 1.5 degrees that governments agreed to aspire towards. And in the words of the UN's environment programme, warming of three degrees would, and I quote, bring mass extinctions and large parts of the planet would be uninhabitable. Here at home, the government is way off track when it comes to meeting its own climate targets. The Committee on Climate Change said in its assessment earlier this year that nowhere near enough progress has been made and those targets are themselves nowhere near ambitious enough. Greta Thunberg famously said, act like your house is on fire because it is. Well, pledging to meet net zero by 2050, as our government has, is like dialing 999 and asking for the fire brigade to come in 30 years time. You know, we need the fire brigade to come now, and that is what we intend with this bill. The bill seeks to build on the successes of the Climate Change Act, which was a historic piece of legislation when it was passed in 2008, and it's been emulated all around the world. But the bill also exists to fix some of the flaws in that climate change bill as well, because on its own, our current Climate Change Act isn't ambitious enough or comprehensive enough to bring about the scale of action that we need. The new bill, the so-called Sea Bill, Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill, was the brainchild of the Sea Bill Alliance, which is a talented group of campaigners, including those who previously fought for the Climate Change Act, it's had input from scientists at the cutting edge of climate and ecology, and my thanks go to all of them. But crucially, this bill is a people's bill, the people's bill. It's sprung from the grassroots with the intention of giving the public a real say on the climate emergency. So in terms of the, the key points of the bill, essentially it would place in law a commitment to doing our fair share of keeping global temperature rises to 1.5 degrees. And that means recognizing that as the first country to industrialize, the UK is disproportionately responsible for the climate emissions that are already in the atmosphere. And therefore we have a greater responsibility to move furthest and fastest in terms of taking action to address that. It patches the holes in the Climate Change Act by ensuring that our climate change targets take account of emissions from things like international aviation and shipping. But the minute they're left out of the Climate Change Act because it was just deemed to too complicated to work out who was responsible for which bit of the emissions. Well, that's not good enough. And so our bill would introduce uh, and ensure that those emissions from aviation and shipping were included, as well as our so-called consumption emissions. The emissions associated with all of the things that we import from other countries. You know, the government likes to say that it's reduced emissions by over 40% since 1990, but that's only because they've outsourced huge swathes of those emissions to countries like China, uh, which manufacture products for us, which we then import. Well, it seems to us that if we're importing and using those products, the emissions associated with their production ought to be on our accounting sheet. And therefore our bill as well would include consumption emissions. When you factor those in, then emissions have only fallen by about 10% since 1990, not the 42% that the government likes to claim. So this bill brings a bit of honesty and responsibility back into climate legislation. It also focuses on nature, on protecting and restoring biodiversity, because we know that we face an ecological crisis as well as a climate crisis. 
The UK is one of the most nature depleted countries in the world, with reports last month showing that the UK government has failed to meet 17 out of 20 UN biodiversity targets. It requires the active restoration of things like our vital peatlands, wetlands and woodlands, which are really important carbon sinks. You know, the, the government likes to talk about tree planting, but actually peatlands store far more carbon than UK forests. I think they store around five and a half billion tonnes compared with 150 million tonnes from, from forests. And yet our government is allowing, indeed encouraging, the burning of peatlands in order to promote grouse shooting. If you ever needed an example of what was kind of, you know, unwarranted, unforgivable acts of environmental vandalism, that would be pretty high on my list of those. The bill ensures that steps are taken so that the supply chains of products that we use in the UK don't cause environmental harm overseas. It calls for a just transition, crucially, for people working in polluting industries, because in tackling the climate crisis, we cannot repeat the grave errors of the past, leaving communities behind. And there are plenty of communities, mining communities, former mining communities that are still struggling in the aftermath of coal pit closures because no provision was made to support, to retrain uh, workers who have been involved in mining. We absolutely need to make sure that that just transition is properly funded and properly supported. The bill states we can't rely on unproven technologies to deliver on essential emission cuts. And overall, it ensures that our targets are big enough and bold enough in the face of the emergencies that we face. Finally, though, it goes further because what it recognizes is that real leadership when it comes to the climate crisis actually has been coming from people, not from government. They haven't shown the necessary boldness nor ambition, and they haven't engaged with people about how we build this just and fair society, which keeps within our planet's environmental limits. And that's why this bill puts real power into the hands of people. It establishes a citizen's assembly to deliberate on the difficult decisions and to put forward a new emergency strategy. And it gives people real agency by making sure that it can't just be ignored by forcing the government to bring the citizen's assembly recommendations to parliament for debate and approval. So in summary, the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill is essential if the UK is to demonstrate real climate leadership and galvanise momentum ahead of COP26 next year. Not the kind of leadership the government likes to talk about while at the same time pumping £27 billion into road building, for example, or giving unconditional bailouts to the aviation industry, but real leadership, which acknowledges the scale of the crisis that we face, that is honest about that, whilst having the courage to see a future that could be filled with hope, particularly if we take this moment post COVID and make sure that the money that no doubt the Chancellor will be about to pump into the economy goes into those green sections of the economy where it will have most use economically as well as having the most benefit environmentally. The bill now has support of around 77 MPs representing all of the opposition parties. It has the official backing of, of six parties, but we know that's not enough. We need to get the Tory MPs on board. We need to make sure that even though the bill has now been tabled and it's theoretically on the books, we need to make sure that there's a real unstoppable campaign behind it to make sure it actually becomes law as well. So I invite all of you to join with us in the campaign, to make the noise, to lobby your MPs, to ask them to join the Sea bill and to be at the forefront of change, not dragging their heels at the back. Parliament led the world by declaring a climate emergency now counting down to the most important climate summit for years, we need all parliamentarians to have a responsibility to, st to step up and be counted in supporting the bill, which provides this vital framework. And we need a movement behind that that makes it impossible for MPs and peers to do anything else. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. That was that was really wonderful, and you set the scene so brilliantly. Um, yes. Now our next speaker, and and I should say that had things not happened, had COVID not happened, COP would be kicking off today in Glasgow, whereas in fact, of course, as we all know, it's not till this time next year. Our next speaker is Tim Jackson, who's the ecological economist, as well as being a director of the Centre for the Understanding of Sustainable Prosperity. He's written a lot about this subject. He wrote Prosperity Without Growth, as well as a book uh, a while ago, but my gosh, you were on the money then, Tim. Material Concerns, Pollution, Profit, and the Quality of Life. You're a 
pioneer of the circular economy, which is, of course, absolutely vital to how we're going to get ourselves anywhere, quite frankly. So over to you, Tim. Thank you, Rosie. And um, thanks for having me there. It's a, it's a privilege to be there. Um, yes, a while ago, as Rosie said, I've been around a while, and that means that I can remember things that happened a long time ago. And uh, so I thought I'd give, because Caroline's done such a good job, really, of setting out the science behind it, I thought I'd just give a little bit of a personal reflection on that. Um, because I can remember back in the day, I think it was 1988 or something, when Margaret Thatcher convened scientists together in Downing Street and, and something called climate change was suddenly on the agenda. I can remember 2000 when the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution put forward a report on climate change, which told us just how much work we had to do. I can remember how influential that was in the Climate Change Act, which was passed in 2018. And, and I, can, I can do a little bit of maths and work out that actually the most influential people in relation to the work that we are looking at at the moment weren't even born when that science was put on the table. And, and that's a really, that's a really it's, a, it's slightly salutary really for, for people who can remember all that stuff because what it means is that old people just don't bother to rethink things. They don't bother to look at the new science. They don't bother to look at the way the understanding has changed. They don't bother to keep up to date. They don't bother to realize actually that the Climate Change Act, good as it was in its time in 2008, is now hopelessly out of date. And that it's actually irresponsible really of government not to review its targets, not to review its actions, not to take seriously something that the Climate and Ecological Emergency Alliance has now put on the table. And I was, uh, when this Climate and Ecological Alliance was being formed, particularly from people like Extinction Rebellion and Fridays for the Future and so on. And this new understanding of the science of climate change was being talked about. And this, I suppose, was a couple of years ago when the IPCC report on a 1.5 world was first published. I was, I was kind of curious because here was a set of people who had no authority, had no political power, who weren't all the time scientists, some of them were, some of them weren't, who were actually setting out an agenda that was faster and further than anything that the most courageous climate act in the world had set in motion. They were saying essentially, we have to cut our carbon more or less in developed countries by about 2025, which is a few years time. It's not 2050, it's not, a, it's not a target for 2050, and it's not an 80% reduction by, by 2050. It's actually basically saying that if we want to remain within the scientific boundaries of, of, a, of a degree of warming that is acceptable, that we can live with. In fact, if we want only a two thirds chance of remaining in that world, we have to act now and we have to act fast. And as a scientist, and I do this stuff for my day job, so I kind of got my spreadsheets out and I tried to decide who was right. And I started from the budget that the IPCC had set out, the carbon budget. It's a very simple concept. It's sort of how much carbon can we afford to burn between now and the end of this century if we want a decent chance of living in a 1.5 degree world. And the IPCC crunched the numbers on that. I didn't have to. And it's a, it's a, if you want to know the number, it's 420 billion tons of carbon dioxide. That's all there is to burn globally if we want to have two thirds chance of staying within 1.5 degrees. It's very, very straightforward in a sense. That's all the carbon we can afford to put in the atmosphere. The carbon in the atmosphere doesn't really care about um, the timescales of government bills. The carbon in the atmosphere doesn't really care about the intransigence of politicians. The carbon in the atmosphere doesn't care what year you were born in and whether you managed to update your knowledge or not. Actually, the science is very, very straightforward. That 420 billion tons is all that the whole world has to burn in terms of carbon if we want a decent world to live in. And so I did a little bit more maths and I asked myself, well, taking into account how many people there are in the UK and our historical responsibility for carbon emissions, how much would that leave the UK to burn between 2018 and the end of the century? And it came down to quite a small number, two and a half billion tonnes. And then I looked at how much we're burning, particularly how much we're burning if we take into account, as Caroline said, all the consumption that comes from imports from overseas where we don't even look at the carbon ourselves in our own accounts. And it turned out that was about 600 million tonnes a year. And then I did a little bit more maths and I figured out that means, and it was 2019 when I was doing it, that means we have to get rid of 
all the carbon that we're burning by 2025. Quite a shock, actually, because that was a year, in fact, that Extinction Rebellion had quite deliberately said, this is when we need to decarbonize by. This is when we need net zero by. And then around about the same time, the government sort of looked at the 1.5 degree report and said, well, let's adjust the Climate Act a little bit. And they came out with a net zero target for 2050. 2050 is too late. And that's exactly the point of people like Greta Thunberg. That's exactly the point of the kids on the street in Fridays for the Future. That's exactly the point that Extinction Rebellion is, make, is making. Tell the truth. The truth is we can't afford to burn carbon beyond about 2025. And that means a faster transition than anyone has talked about. It means taking it seriously, act as though it were true. And, and that is the challenge that this bill puts before Parliament. I'm delighted that so many MPs have, have signed up to it. There's still about 523, slightly more than that, left to go, I think, <laughs> if we want um, something like a decent consensus of, of honourable people in Parliament to understand, actually, that their wisdom has fallen behind the times and the, and the wisdom of the streets, the wisdom of Extinction Rebellion, the wisdom of the Climate and Ecological um, emergency bill alliance, the wisdom of Extinction Rebellion, that wisdom is the one that we should be listening to because it accords with the science. It is scientifically valid, it has integrity, it has responsibility, and it is the basis for a sensible um, legislation that would put us back into a place where we could hold our heads high and say we are taking moral responsibility for the damage we've caused to the planet. So I'm going to stop there. I'm happy to obviously be here and to be able to answer some questions later. And I'm sure there'll be some of those. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you very much indeed, Tim. And I'm absolutely sure there will be questions. That was a pretty um, that was a pretty terrifying um, few minutes, actually, when you say the words by 2025. I mean, that's not many birthdays away, as they say. Um, but thank you. I know we will come back to a lot of what you said. Our next speaker is Kate. Rayworth, who is the author of the wonderful book called The Donut Economics, Seven Ways to Think Like 21st Century Economists. This has been a massively influential book on how to think about economics, um, available to everyone. I mean, she's got such a wonderful, fluid, easy style to understand. And it has been translated, I'm just looking up, 18 languages. Um, she's also the co-founder of the Economics Action Lab. And in addition to everything else, she's also working in Amsterdam and working with the government. Kate, what a pleasure to have you here. And um, thank you very much indeed. And now over to you to carry on the debate. Thanks, Rosie, and thank you to everyone who's organised this uh, bill and this meeting. I'm completely honoured to be sandwiched in between Caroline, Tim and Kumi, and they're doing such a fantastic job of talking about the urgency and the specifics of this bill. I'm going to pull back and tell us, remind us why we need to be here and why we need to take this big picture at this moment. So I'm just going to share my screen. I want to share some pictures with you. So this century, Let's just look only at the last 20 years. This century has begun with repeated crises, be it a financial meltdown, the ecological and climate breakdown that we live in, and right now the COVID lockdown that's being endured worldwide. What strikes me is that these crises emerge from the very systems that we create. They emerge from our endless expansionism, whether it's the endless expanding of financial markets that then collapse on themselves, or humanity's endless expansion of use of fossil fuels and indeed of industrial capacity, or our endless expansion into wild places and our endless flying and interconnectivity. These crises are the boomerang effects of that way of living. And we know we need to transform. So we need a new vision of what human prosperity looks like in the 21st century, because it ain't endless growth. And this, I bring the donut. So the goal here is to leave no one falling short on the essentials of life in the hole in the middle of that donut without food, water, healthcare, education, housing. I can say these with conviction because the world governments have already agreed that every person in the world has a claim to meeting every one of these social essentials. So leave no one in the hole, get them over that social foundation. This is human rights. But we must add to that now 21st century knowledge that at the same time, we can't overshoot that ecological ceiling because then we put so much pressure on our life supporting systems, our planet, 
we break them down. We cause climate breakdown. We acidify our oceans. We create a hole in the ozone layer. These are, of course, the planetary boundaries whose recognition is just a decade old, which is astounding, that we are so young in understanding our deep interconnectedness upon each other and with the rest of the living world. But now we understand it. Now we know it. We can't unknow it. And we must act on it. As Tim says, once this knowledge comes, we must update our commitments and our actions and our legislation to reflect it. So this is the donut and the goal is to meet the needs of all within the means of the planet. It's very different from the 20th century goal of endless growth. It's about thriving in balance and that changes everything. Right now, we are so far from thriving in balance. We are falling short on the essentials of life for billions of people worldwide. And we are already in overshoot on multiple planetary boundaries, especially you can see here on climate breakdown, on excessive fertilizer use, land conversion, and biodiversity loss, the breakdown of the web of life. These overshoots show us the climate and ecological crisis that we're in. So we humanity have to take this as our collective selfie to recognize this is who we are in these early days of the 21st century. And our job now is one that no generation before us even tried to do, which is to meet the needs of all people for the first time in human history, while already coming back within planetary boundaries. We would be insane if we thought last century's economic theories or governmental policies or business models would do anything to solve this problem because they were not designed to take this on. We have to come up with designs and ambition and courage of our own and these times to take on this challenge that we're the first generation to fully see. So this is the global donut, but of course, much policy happens at the national level. So let me bring it down. Here are three nations done some brilliant research done by researchers at Leeds University. You can see the website at the bottom. I invite you to go and explore three very different countries on the spectrum. Let's start with Rwanda massively falling short on meeting people's essential needs. Those re that red deprivation must be eliminated to leave nobody falling short on, on the essentials of life in Rwanda, but well within their fair share of planetary boundaries, hardly putting any pressure on this planet. Brazil in the middle, like many countries like China and many middle incomes, both significantly falling short on the essentials of life, but already in overshoot, a double whammy of meeting its people's needs while already coming back within planetary boundaries. And then the UK. We are the same. We look very similar to nearly all high income countries, except let's note that as one of the richest countries in the world, we should be completely filling in that center circle blue. There should be no red deprivation, but there is because of inequalities in the UK. But we are massively in overshoot on those planetary boundaries. And by the way, they go way, way, way beyond that dotted line. Let's be clear that that overshoot isn't just resource use within the UK, it's all the resource embedded in our consumption of imports from overseas. The emissions, the material footprint, the water, the fertilizer, the land use, the timber, we claim it and recognize it's our consumption impact here. So three very different countries on the spectrum, very different levels of income per capita. Let me put that in the context of 150 nations. The sweet spot is that top left-hand corner where we meet the needs of all people within the means of the planet and no nation here is close to doing so. And every country here must now go on a transformational journey, the lowest income countries to meet the needs of all people without falling into that massive degradation of overshoot that countries before them have done. We know that old path is not feasible. The middle income countries must do the double whammy of meeting people's needs already coming back within planetary boundaries and then the high income countries and there's the UK. The high income countries that must make an unprecedented journey back within planetary boundaries while meeting the needs of all their people for the first time and doing this as a just transition. For all countries in the world, this calls for unprecedented level of humility because we've never been here before and unprecedented ambition to know that this is the obvious and the only essential journey that we need to make this century. So what would it mean for a nation to take on this question? And we invite many cities and countries to ask themselves a very 21st century question of what would it mean for us to aim to get into the donut? I'm going to share it here. I have to say, I've shared this question with cities and countries the world over that this is the first time but I'm sharing it actually as a UK question. So to be quite honest, it means a lot to me. Here is the question we invite ambitious places to ask themselves. How can the UK 
be a home to thriving people in a thriving place while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet. Now you can hear in there, there's a social question and an ecological question. There's a local question and a global question. This breaks down into four questions and this is the last big thing I want to share. And I invite us all to reflect on what this means for us as the UK right now at the start of this decade. What would it mean for the people of the UK to thrive? Who are we in our diversity and our values and our aspirations? And what would it mean for us all to thrive and to thrive as we make this transformational journey to where we already know we need to go? What would it mean for the UK to thrive within its natural habitat? Look at this phenomenally beautiful set of islands. And we know they are desperately depleted. What would it mean to restore the beautiful lands that we call home? to regenerate the soils and the peatlands, to rewild nature, to bring back the woodland, to bring back British wildlife, to allow Earth's ecosystems to return to the genius and the generosity that nature has when we allow her, her space and her full generous performance. So how do we restore that? Now these two here are local aspiration. This is to be a thriving people in a thriving place to make the UK a beautiful, brilliant place to live, but it's only half the story. We have to always put local aspiration in the context of global responsibility, because we know that every nation is embedded in a web of relationships of drawing materials and embedded in relationships of supply chains worldwide. So we must ask, what would it mean for the UK to respect the health of the whole planet? To ensure that our way of life is not deforesting the Amazon, is not destroying landscapes, is not fishing empty the sea. How do we do that without putting our carbon into the atmosphere? No matter where it's released in the world, if it's in products that are consumed here, we take responsibility for that footprint. So how do we come back within planetary boundaries? And think of the supply chains of food and clothing and electronics and consumer goods and construction materials, all the materials that are embodied in that. We must bring that within planetary boundaries and still think of those supply chains. And now think of the people who work in those supply chains. And we must ask ourselves, how can the UK respect the well-being of people worldwide who pick and pack our fruit, who stitch and sew our clothes, who dig and transport the construction materials and then take the waste and unpack and dispose of it. The people and the communities worldwide who are impacted by the way that we live in the UK. So this is the question that I believe all ambitious towns and cities and communities and nations and communities of nations must ask themselves. And what I like about the Sea Bill is that it invites us to ask these questions and to answer them in legislation. It invites us to ask what would it mean to restore the lands of the UK and to ensure that we do that. It invites us to ask how do we live within the means of the planet and tackle the climate and ecological emergency, respecting our long history of impact and our first responsibility to move. And it invites us to ask what would it mean to do so with a tra just transition for people who live in the UK and for people we affect worldwide. Is it complex? Of course it's complex. The 21st century is complex. And if we don't approach complex issues with a mindset that recognizes that, we will fail at the first hurdle. So for me, this is the question. And that is why I'm here in full support of the Sea Bill. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Kate. That was that was fantastic. And um, those slides were really interesting, too. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, you're right. It's just when you think about, you know, the end of mining communities and what people needed to do to, to come out of it. And we we never think, do we? Um, we always just abandon ship. And it's a bit like people leave, leaving North Africa or in the past. You could always go to somewhere else when you'd completely screwed up the land you were trying to grow things on. There was always another place to go. And now there isn't. Um, thank you. I know there'll be lots of questions coming. So. Uh, our last speaker is, tonight is Kumi Naidu, who, as I think I said earlier, was Amnesty International's Secretary General, Ninth Secretary General, for, for many years. Um, no, he worked some years. But now, Kumi, you run an organization called Africans Rising, which is for justice, peace, and climate and dignity. Um, you've been involved, I think, quite a lot in the formation of this bill. So um, over to you. Thank you for being here. 
Thank you, Rosie. Greetings, everybody, and uh, greetings from a very, very warm South Africa where I'm speaking to you from. Uh, I must start by saying that I'm reminded of a moment of history uh, during the anti-apartheid struggle. If you followed a panel like the one that we've just heard, you started by saying most of the really good points I wanted to make have been eloquently made by the previous speakers. And then you said, oh, well, for emphasis, and then you spoke for about two hours. I've got a few minutes. Let me just say that I fully endorse the sentiments, the passion, and so on made by the previous speakers. And just to correct, uh, Rosie, I'm the volunteer global ambassador of Africans Rising for Justice, Peace, and Dignity, which I played a role in setting up prior to joining Amnesty. I want to use this opportunity then to bring a global perspective, but actually not a global perspective, if I might, but bring a specifically African perspective to this debate rooted in a global South frame. I think listening to this conversation, it's important from an African perspective, we say very loudly that the way Africa is framed in these conversations, especially by the UK government, and when Tony Blair used to say, Africa is a scar on the conscience of humanity, as Africans, we looked and we said, actually, no, if you want to put it in those terms, Europe is actually a scar on the conscience of humanity because Europe gave us colonialism, slavery, fossil fuels, and a whole bunch of other things. And so what we want to assert, this view that Africa is a poor, desperate continent, is to continuously remind the world that Africa is the richest continent underneath the ground, and that's precisely why we are one of the poorest continents above the ground. And do not think there is not a relationship between the legacies of slavery, colonialism, and the fossil fuel industrial complex that we have. It's very important that people recognize that when slavery ended, right, slavery, part of why slavery was able to end as far as the power brokers of that time were concerned, was because they could replace that cheap labor with fossil fuel driven, uh, driving the economy, right? So, it's really important that we recognize that we ended, supposedly ended slavery with no compensation for the people that suffered. But Dominic Cummings and his relatives, for example, all received um, compensation as slave owners. Those that uh, are slave owners, you can look that up, it's a fact. Uh, and, and these injustices are now pretty clear for us to actually say that we question the legitimacy, the honesty, of the British government and the British state. And we rather put our faith in the British people who obviously are operating in a very complex political system. Uh, and the first past the post reality means that you constantly get governments in the UK as well as another place that have 33% mandates and we call that democracy. And all of these things must be put on the table right now if we are going to actually have the kinds of changes. And therefore, this CEE bill is a recognition that the current politics is not working, right? The current configuration not working, we need something new. And yeah, I commend the people in the Alliance that are doing this work because you are taking into consideration what Albert Einstein once said when he said, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting to get different results. Those of us like myself, who've been activists for 40 years. Unfortunately, that's true. <laughs> what do we have to show for it? If we are brutally honest right now, we must say we have failed and we are failing and that the voices that are coming from the street right now, especially from young people, are the voices that we actually need to take much more seriously than we've done in the past. We also have to recognize that the reality in the world today is not that we just have climate injustice, but we also have in the sense that the people that the places in the world which contributed most to the problem are not the places in the world that are facing the most brutal and the first impacts of climate change. They're happening in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America. Yes, there are forest fires now in Australia and, um, and, and California, which is tragic. But you know what's more tragic for us? I don't want to put it bluntly. So now that white people are being affected, there seems to be more media coverage and so on. 
That's the reality, right? And we have to confront that for Britain to get things right moving forward, it must confront its legacy of crimes of, against humanity. And let's be very blunt. When we look at the optimism of the moment, right? For Africans rising, we see a connection between racial injustice, environmental injustice, and other forms of injustice intersecting. We don't see them as, as, as silos standing on their own. And, and, and here's the difficulty we have when we look at establishment. You got a monarchy and a government that has not even acknowledged the crimes of slavery and colonialism. They've not apologized for it, let alone offering any sort of redress and compensation. And in fact, to make things worse, you know, Boris, uh, Donald Trump and Boris Johnson, right? You can celebrate Donald Trump going out of the White House, might be going out of the White House, kicking and screaming. But let's be clear, those two people are professed friends. They don't deny it. And let's be very clear that Boris Johnson is no less a racist and a xenophobe than Donald Trump is. And I want to place on record that these issues, in terms of how you balance, we cannot rely on normal parliamentary process. And that is why we want to support this effort. And, and if you think I'm being unfair on Boris Johnson, I refer you to an article he wrote in The Spectator less than uh, just over a decade ago, when he said, the best thing that could happen to Africa is for Europe and the citizens to scramble back in a direction. And this time we should not have to apologize. That was just in 2002. So when we look at all of this, I want to conclude by saying that the biggest problem that we have today in the world from an economic perspective and a health perspective, the biggest disease is not affluent that we face. The biggest disease that humanity faces is a disease that we can call affluenza, which is a pathological illness that a good, meaningful, decent life comes from more and more and more and more material consumption. And unless we recognize that our whole economic system is built on an absolute lie, right, of a calculation called GDP, right, which is a measurement of wealth, right, which is a absolutely useless definition for today, if ever it was. So you go and chop down the entire forest, it's a positive tick on GDP. So I want to end by saying that this CEE bill has the possibility of inspiring a new kind of activism, a new kind of participation through these citizens' assemblies. There are going to be a lot of people who are going to scoff at it, including a lot of people from mainstream civil society, right? But I encourage you to actually innovate along these ways because other things are not working. And therefore, we have to have the courage to actually think differently. I want to end with the words of Ma uh, Martin Luther King to just inspire us. Speaking in the mid-1960s, he said, my friends, as I come to the end of my speech, I want to note that in the field of modern child psychology, there's a very dominant term called maladjusted. Now, all of us want to be well-adjusted and not suffer from schizophrenia or other mental illnesses. But my friends, I say to you, there are certain things in our world that are so unjust and immoral that good, decent people should refuse to be well-adjusted. He went on to say, I never intend to adjust myself to religious bigotry, racial discrimination. And on the economy, very important, he said, I never intend to adjust myself to economic conditions that will take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few when millions of God's children are smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in an affluent society. So I say to you, the climate crisis is not a crisis in isolation. The climate crisis is fundamentally an economic crisis. It's a crisis of greed. It's a crisis of overconsumption. And unless we have the courage and the strength to say that we have to transform our economic system and to get ordinary people into the conversation to push for it, I think we are also kidding ourselves about whether we can deliver the kinds of massive seismic changes that we need to make in this decade, which I would end by saying is probably the most consequential mm -hmm. decade in human history. Thank you. Kumi, thank you very much indeed. And yes, I think we would all absolutely agree that we are 2020 is the year that we have to start the most important decade. We should have started some time ago. Um, 
before I come, we've got a lot of questions coming in, which I'm going to go to. I, just when you've been just talking just now, I mean, we're in the middle of the trade bill. How would you see trade with Africa between us and Africa? How would you make it fair? Sorry, you just cut off there. Can you just say that no, again? Just, I, I just, you know, we're doing trade bills at the moment and trying to work out about standards. And, and I just wanted to know what your view would be about how do we have healthy trade, which ah. spreads so, prosperity, but I mean, also trade is responsible for an enormous amount of things that go hopelessly wrong. Well, I think there needs to be massive changes in the whole trading system. I think we, we have had multiple issues, if I can just speak from an African perspective. One is we have had very restrictive market access mm -hmm. for in North America and so on. Uh, but we've also had dumping, right, of highly subsidized goods from Europe into African markets. So for example, you know, at one stage, the European Union, not very long ago, was subsidizing every European cow to the tune of two euros a day, when many Africans live on less than that, right? So then you have over over supply in Europe that has been dumped in various markets, like for example, poultry in Ghana, where in fact, local producers can even, even compete in their own markets because mm -hmm. it's cheap goods. So there's some obvious things that have to be sorted out. And these are old grievances that have been ignored. And just to note, the current WTO negotiation round, the so-called Doha development round, which started in 1997, right, I believe, it's still not yet completed, right? And that is where the global community, by which I mean, because I'm, I'm using the global community the way the international power brokers talk, the rich dominant nations of the world who have controlled the trading system yeah. must now apply some measure of justice, not only to support people elsewhere, but ultimately I believe it's gonna be in their long-term self-interest as well. Thank you very much for that. So um, I'm going to come on to some of the questions that we've had sent in. Um, Tim, why do we need a, 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 this bill when we have a Climate Change Act, a government's environment bill, and proposed legislation on supply chains and deforestations? Uh, well, I guess that was um, the thrust of what I was trying to say. In a sense, we need it because the science has changed, our understanding has changed, we did nothing for too long, and now we are in a state of emergency. The emergency is different from uh, mm -hmm. the situation that we were in perhaps 20 years ago, 30 years ago when we first had the knowledge. Emergency means you have to act now, and acting now means creating the legislative framework to do that. That's what the bill does. And it, it insists on scientific robustness, it insists on fairness and responsibility, it insists on integrity rather than instrumentalism. It makes clear that we don't solve one problem by, by mass planting, plantation, forestry, that we have to respect nature as well as the climate. And nothing we have in legislation so far achieves that. That's why this bill is needed. And will, I mean, what, what I see happens so much is that, you know, things get siloed. I mean, I do lots of work around food policy. and Food's in every single department. It's impossible to pull things together. Um, how will this bill prevent this siloing that we have where we take one tiny step forward in one department and the next department rushes backwards several steps? I, I, think it, I think it will do that by bringing the future into the present. I think it will do that by bringing our responsibility to the future into the present. If you think that environmental targets are mm -hmm. things that you can achieve in 2050, this, this administration is not going to do anything about it. No administration is going to do anything seriously, urgently about something that it thinks might happen in 2050. The science tells us that's not the case. The science tells us now is the time to act. And when you look at the scale at which you must act, then you begin to realize all the places in the economy, in society, mm -hmm. that you have to take actions. And, and actually, you know, one of the, the most encouraging things out of a year of tragedy and loss is an understanding of the speed with which government can act when it needs to act. This is the same kind of emergency. It's, its timescales are very, very similar and its effects 
maybe even more devastating. So I think that's that's exactly what the bill puts front and center and calls government's attention to. And does does China's um, China's decision announce? I mean, they're in recent announcements. Is that? I mean, that's a long way off too. Do you feel that that's just a punt into the future? It, it is a punt into the future. China's in a very different situation in the sense that it is still actually an emerging nation, and although much of what we look at in China is fairly frightening, you can also look at things in China which are technologically faster than we have managed to be in Europe and look at it with some envy. It doesn't change any of the position that Kumi set out for us very, very clearly mm. that the developed nations have a responsibility to act faster than anyone else in mm. the world because we are responsible for the greater proportion of the damage. Rosie, Thank you. Rosie, can I add something? Yes, of course you can, Kumi. Yes. You know, uh, some of you might know that I was uh, six years the head of Greenpeace International between 2009 and 2016. And, you know, in that role, as a person from the global south, I had such a difficult time with uh, governments in the global south, right? Because um, we had a policy of saying, you know, the common and differentiated responsibilities, because we said all countries have to take action. Of course, there are some differentiated responsibilities, so those that carry a greater historical burden should do more. But it was so difficult. I remember speaking with the, after the Copenhagen collapsed, I was in China meeting with the head of the Chinese uh, climate negotiation was the vice minister of planning. And he basically said, listen, Mr. Minister Zay, his name was, he said, see, I agree with everything you are saying. I understand the climate science, but explain to me, how do I go to my bosses up there, right? In the Politburo, the Central Com uh, Committee of the Communist Party and say to them, you have to get off coal. When mm -hmm. the country built the economy, like the United States are still continuing with coal and are not stopping. This was in 2009, okay? And so let's understand that if the countries that historically built the economies on dirty energy don't do something really bold, uh, ambitious, and so on, it makes it really difficult to get our countries in the global south to bypass the dirty energy route in yeah. terms of no, I get that. So, Caroline, here's a quite technical question for you. What What is the, the CEE's bill on net, on negative emission technologies? I know this is a bit of a thorny issue. Yeah, it's a very difficult issue. And I think overall our position on, on negative emission technologies is that we are incredibly sceptical about them. Uh, we're deeply worried about them. We recognise how damaging they can be. But it's also true that as a last resort, we've left open the possibility of potentially using some nets in very restricted circumstances, and only if there's an independent assessment that they'll cause no critical impacts on ecosystems. And so to explain why we've done that, having just said how, how potentially dangerous they are, well, I was persuaded essentially by scientists like Kevin Anderson and Yuri Rogeri, who've been advising us on this bill, and, and they are in the forefront of of bringing social justice and climate justice together. And I've been persuaded by them when they say, currently there is no mitigation pathway in the scientific literature that limits global warming to 1.5 degrees without some element of carbon dioxide removal. Mm -hmm. now, carbon dioxide removal includes both natural climate solutions, in other words, restoring peatlands and mm -hmm. forests, as well as these negative emission technologies, things like the bioenergy with CCS. Now, Clearly the bill, first of all, prioritizes reducing greenhouse gas emissions at source, including both production and consumption. In parallel, it foresees the restoration and enhancement of land to be an efficient carbon sink. In other words, that's the natural climate solutions. And then it does make clear that if nets are needed, they can only be used to bring down temperatures back below 1.5 in the case of overshoot, for example, and to compensate for past emissions. They can't be used to compensate for any ongoing emissions. The bill bans their use to offset the vast majority of emissions, including um, emissions from burning fossil fuels, transport, homes, and so forth. But I've been persuaded and, and you know, it, the, the, the bill is a, a work in progress and, and, and maybe someone else will persuade us otherwise. But right now, the drafters of the bill have been persuaded 
that unless that, that there are some sectors that might not be able to reduce in time like steel or cement and some agriculture mm -hmm. where we might need a small amount of nets under very very strict conditions but i recognize that's controversial it's not a position that i take um lightly but when i'm advised by someone like kevin anderson from the tyndall institute that there is currently no mitigation pathway that foresees reaching the targets we need without without any of these then i just think we need to listen to that that's really interesting yes that's um yeah that's really scary as well yes another scary fact um can i can i stay with you and then it'd be interesting to get other people's comments i mean this is a private members bill um yet you, you know you talk about it in relation to cop 26 um how far can you get with a private members bill at this moment well, I, I, I think we need to recognize that it's it's a step in an overall strategy. So, you know, it would be lovely if the government came up and said, hey, this private members bill makes perfect sense. We'll make some parliamentary time for it and we'll debate it and, and pass it. Now, clearly, right now, that's not going to happen. But I think it's important to remember that the groundbreaking 2008 Climate Change Act, ground, groundbreaking when it was passed, mm -hmm. that actually started life as a private members bill brought in 2005 by the late and great Michael Meacher, much, mm -hmm. much missed. And on the back of that, there was an early day motion and so on. Now that was three years in advance of the act actually happening, but it began to build the momentum. It was mm -hmm. used as a kind of lobbying tool in parliament and in the Lords. It gave people a focus. Uh, and then it meant that when we did have in that case, a more favorable government, the Labour government came along, then they were able to, to, to pick it up. It was pretty much already written and run with it. And I guess, you know, we're looking at something well, it needs to be faster than that, unfortunately, but basically we're looking at a way of trying to build momentum, momentum off the back of it. And, and you know, if it isn't this private members bill, then maybe it will be some other mechanism. But what we've got here is a kind of blueprint or, or cream mm -hmm. of how it could happen, what needs to happen. And I think, you know, the fact that peers for the planet are supporting it is amazing. We've got six political parties supporting it. If we could just start to chip away at some conservatives, then maybe we could get a bit of a, yeah, a bit of the ratchet that we need. And do you have any hopes for the environment bill or I mean where do you see being able to work with what's coming along? Well I mean the environment bill and the agriculture bill ought to be vehicles where we could be you know hanging some of these obligations but unfortunately as you'll know with the agriculture bill I mean there's almost nothing about climate change in that and I've tried in the commons and I've no doubt you've tried in the Lords to introduce amendments that would make sure that that climate was uh, was an absolute key objective of the agriculture bill to make sure that we're reducing emissions and we, we didn't succeed similarly with the environment bill we haven't got the the tools with the uh, office of environmental protection is nothing like strong enough uh, to, to to really kind of bring the regulation that we need to uh, to, to bring this kind of, of set of policies around so all of us in the lords and the, and, and the commons are doing our best with those pieces of legislation that are going yeah. to parliament on their own, they're certainly not strong enough to get us where we need to be. Oh, um, Kate, um, when we come to trying to think of how big the behaviour change of developed countries is in terms of just, just our buying habits of the whole way that the capitalist system works, how do you, I mean, if you're talking to a bank or to, well, to anyone or to me, I mean, how, how do you, how do the new economics, how are we going to make them stick and what are we going to have to do? Because it's an incredible transition we have to make, isn't it? It is indeed. So three things. So first of all, I'm going to invite all of us not to talk about developed countries anymore, because I don't think there are any. I can't think of a single country in the world that has the right to put up its hand and say we're developed. From that picture I showed you, there ain't one anywhere close. And the richest countries in the world definitely cannot make that claim from everything that Kumi said. And the very fact that their advancement material advancement has been built on the backs of so many other countries, mm -hmm. whether it's through colonialism or unequal trade relations or indeed the impacts of climate change. So let's not talk about developed. We're all developing countries now and we all need that humility and ambition. Second, so countries like ours, high income, high consumption countries. Yes, it's a tr huge transformation. You mentioned both consumption and the behaviors and lifestyles. And then you also talked about companies. And I want to talk about both of those because they both matter and we can't, we can't dismiss one with the other. So let me start with individual lives, right? There is so much we each can do. We can sit within our homes and think, how do I eat? How do I shop? How do I travel? How do I heat my home? 
Where do I save my money? And I can move those things. You can move your bank account to a bank that actually invests in social environmental return. You can move your electricity account to a company that actually provides 100% renewable energy. You can transform your diet to mostly plants mm -hmm. or almost only plants. So there is so much we can do, travel on two wheels or two feet instead of that default car, use public transport. We know these things. In fact, there's a fantastic new website that I want to tell. It's called takethelink.org. And no, it's called takethejump.org. And it's a, a, a new website that says, here are six transformative things that you can do. If you want to make your own lifestyle compatible with living on, keeping global heating below 1.5 degrees, this is what you need to do. Things like only get a new phone once every seven or eight years, only buy new clothes tw twice or tw three times a year, eat almost only plants, use only public transport. So I really invite people to visit that and take on that leap. But let's talk about companies because this definitely isn't a story about individuals doing mm -hmm. the right thing and buying the right things. We need to transform business. And I want to start with bring in your minds the donut. This is the, this is the foundations of life. We know the foundations of human rights, on a thriving planet this much is true these are the laws and the rights that, to which we're committed now let's invite the economy into this space and ask ourselves what kind of economy is compatible with meeting the needs of all within the means of this living planet and it's a different one from the one we have you mentioned capitalism people often throw this word around and i, I want to catch it and say hang on hang on mm -hmm. there's too much packed in there sometimes when people talk about capitalism what they actually mean is markets I think there will be markets in the future, but we can make markets work for people. Markets are a very smart way of allocating and communicating information, but they do not have to be dominated by the kind of entities and enterprises that we have today. Sometimes when people talk about capitalism, they mean the kind of Marxist position of the separation of the means of production from the workers. Well, 20th century technologies did that. 20th century energy was generated in oil rigs and pipelines and factories were Fordist factories and the worker was a diminished little person who came and got a wage and went home. 21st century technologies enable us to reunite the labor and employees with the means of production. People can run their own companies with renewable energy, own their own communications device. We can have creative commons licensing. We can have completely different kind of enterprise. So you can have a lot more employee owned, mm -hmm. self owned, locally owned, small scale enterprises that connect globally. Thirdly, when people talk about capitalism, they mean business that's designed to extract profit endlessly. And that's the one that worries me. And that's yeah. the one we need to talk about and transform because on a planet that's dying, essentially, we need to reinvest and restore this planet. And we massively need to redistribute the returns of enterprise and the returns of opportunity. But we currently have corporations that are designed almost legally in some countries. They say it's their fiduciary duty to extract the maximum value for the owners of the enterprise. Why? Why would we design an enterprise to do that? Why? And how in any way is that compatible with people on a thriving planet? So I believe there's a deep redesign question at the heart of enterprise and it's a big existential question to companies that depend upon that extractive model. There are, thank goodness, many new ways of running enterprises that have a social purpose or a living purpose that distribute their profits far more equitably with everybody through the supply chain or with their employees and that reinvest in regenerating the world. And that is the kind of enterprise we have to champion and make happen. Well, I love the idea of that, but I think it still doesn't quite answer the question of sort of, you know, the human desire to have more which in a way the planet has been running on. How do we, how do we turn around and say, actually you've all got enough? The human desire Should to have more is one of many, many human desires. We are a deeply social animal in our own bodies. We know satiation. And actually mm -hmm. if we all, I mean, I have, I have 12 year old children and I see them drawn into these mobile phones. I want to fling them across the room already because these corporations have captured the attention of my children. In, in a device that aims to yeah. sling them in. This is just one part of our personality. There are so many other parts of us. And actually Tim Jackson has done such phenomenal work and the cost is so phenomenal. I'm gonna just hand the microphone to him if I may. Yes. I know we have a smart word on this very question. Okay, Tim. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure that I want to talk too much about it because I, I, I just noted in the, 
in the chat. I mean, there, there are, as Kate says, lots of things to read about the human desire for more. Actually, you know, it's kind of a hundred years or so ago that old the idea that there's an instinct for acquisition. As one of the very first psychologists once told it, talked about it, and it's mostly, um, you know, as old as as the idea itself, and 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 probably a complete load of rubbish it, it you know we of course if you put kids in the candy shop they're going to want to eat the sweets forever that's what parents are for that's what society is for that's what an understanding of health is for and actually they will never grow up into healthy adults if they don't if they don't um, overcome this instinct for acquisition that never really existed in the first place but was a kind of figment of of a of um, uh, the imagination of a psychologist who didn't see beyond the development of children but i, I really I'm, i just noted in the chat that my um Long-time colleague who's been around as long as me, and and a little bit longer actually, Jonathan Porritt, accused us of glo of something called global wittering on, um, which I think is a new phrase which I'm going to adopt from now on, and and asked us to address the question. Um, you know, surely we need to talk about how to get this this bill into legislation and create it as an act. So I want to sort of turn that around a little bit, and particularly to ask Caroline, of course, what do you want from us to get? this bill to take this bill further forwards because it's it's such you know it's such an important piece of legislation if it were to become an act it would it would change the way that governments departments in all sorts of ways approach their their actions and it would force us to focus on you know getting beyond global wittering on whatever that is but it's uh, it's it's it sort of is an apt description for a situation in which we need the urgency of getting this bill in place and and obviously there are lots of people on the call who might be able to offer all kinds of resources to help with that, including me. Just tell me what you need from me. Okay, Please. Caroline, over to you. Thank you. Um, well, and thank you to Jonathan, because that was a, a good reminder that, that interesting though it is to go down some of these rabbit holes, we need to kind of think about how we build momentum behind all of this. And um, I mean, I guess what I would say that we need is that whatever kind of organization or, or or the things that you do in your spare time, whether it's the Women's Institute or or, or a local sports club or, or whatever, to get people talking about this and mobilizing around it. So we build a much bigger movement behind it because we know that it is possible for people power to push hard and make change happen. We know from the, the climate assembly that we've already had, the one that was set up by the six um, select committees that actually when people are given objective information they come up with ideas that are far bolder than government ever does. So the UK Citizens Assembly of a few months back came up with saying, yes, we want a frequent flyer levy. Uh, yes, we want a ban on high carbon products being advertised. Uh, we want free buses, for example, and free public transport. So I don't think we should think it would be impossible to, to bring people with us on this. Um, but what we need is as many allies in as many different places as possible. So. I think as well that if we could have business, I don't know, Tim or Jonathan or others, but I, I don't think it's too um, unrealistic to imagine that at least some parts of business can be our allies on this. I've been struck so much over the past few months how so often it's been a coalition of businesses writing to government saying, for God's sake, you know, set out the plan going forward, give us the goalposts, don't keep changing them on a weekly basis, and then we would know what the terrain is within which we need to make our investment decisions. Similarly with green finance, I mean, again, we've just had some announcements today and people like Mark Carney have been playing a really important role when it comes to green finance. We, we already know that putting investment in the greener parts of the economy makes the best sense in terms of return on investment, in terms of speed, in terms of job creation. So even if you didn't give a toss about the environment and climate, there are really, really good reasons for being able to put investment into the greener parts of the, of the economy. So somehow, if there are people on this call who have some traction with with business groups then then let's try and start a conversation with them if there's some traction with people in the city let's have the conversation with them and certainly for for the bulk of the rest of us who perhaps don't have those linkages then to build this grassroots campaign and to take it out into every you know every sort of bit of our of our lives but but particularly those places you know like the women's institute which which had such a big effect in the past on some some sort of mm. social justice and climate issues to, to get them to pick it up, to make sure this is something that in the end politicians can't say no to. And, and I do think that young people have played such a, an amazing role so, so far. You know, so many people have said, so many older people like us have said that when it's your own kids looking you in the eyes and saying, 
your generation have utterly trashed mm. our future. That there is nothing that is more compelling than that. And, and I know that in the days of COVID, it's much harder for young people to be on the streets or to be doing their amazing climate strikes and so forth. But I just do want to pay tribute for what they've already done because I think they've changed the, the context for this debate. And I hope very much that, that we can find ways of making sure their voices get heard as we go forward as well. Is this the point of having more climate assemblies as part of your next, next actions? Well, the climate assembly is, 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 is more something that would be set up by the bill, by the government through, through the bill to start to give the government maybe a bit more backbone and spine when it comes to coming up with some, some more ambitious ways of achieving the, um, the goals of the bill. So in a sense, it's, it, at that point, it's more of something that would happen once the bill was, was, was enacted, but certainly, you know, there are loads of, of, of towns and cities around the country that are already doing this, which is brilliant. You know, Brighton and Hove, just to talk mm. about my own city, have a climate um, assembly that's ongoing right now. And there have been some loads in London and many up in the north as well. And, and I think the more evidence that we can amass through those processes to demonstrate to government that actually they are laggards in this, yeah. that public opinion and business, or at least some bits of business, not all of it, but, but some of it at least, can be allies on this and they can afford to go further. Uh, and, and there is a greater public appetite and mandate for, more, for, for bolder change than they assume. There's a lot of questions coming in about Tory MPs, basically, as, as a group. Uh, I'm not going to single out any particular question, but just that, you know, I, I certainly see it, stuff gets knocked back. I mean, we in the food world, you know, it took Marcus Rashford for a massive government U-turn over the weekend. Um, how do you swing, I mean, given the state of the government's majority, what do you think are going to be the things that are going to move the Tory MPs? What's the Marcus Rashford equivalent here? <laughs> oh, well, I was rather hoping it might be you in a way, it, it, just in the <laughs> sense that um, I think it might be easier to get some traction in the Lords before we try to go to the yeah. Commons. It almost feels like there's a kind of, you know, who's going to move first, who's going to put their head above the parapet, and once a few people have, then I think it becomes a lot easier. And generally speaking, I think people in the Lords tend to have a little bit more latitude. Uh, to Absolutely. To so I don't know whether or how many tours there are in Peers for the Planet, but, but if that's a starting point. Um, and having these conversations, you know, I think if they were to sit down with, with Kate and Kumi and, and Tim and to hear the kind of presentations that we've just had, you know, I would, I would be really interested in what their... <laughs> on what their argument against doing it would be, frankly. Um, so I think it's going to depend on, a, on some serious investment of time with half a dozen key conservatives that we can decide who they are. And then when they're up over the parapet, then I think it might be easier for more. Okay, um, Tim, where, where do you see in terms of the, the politics at the moment of this? I mean, something that interests me a lot is should we all have personal carbon budgets? Um, Is that a way we have to think about going forward? I mean, it, I find it quite difficult to, you know, for people to understand, everyone can understand eating a bit less meat, uh, you know, but then the, when that last lot of citizens' assemblies were in, the, one of the things that came back was people really didn't want to stop flying. You know, they were prepared to do all sorts of other things. Yeah, I, I happen to think that, that, that personal carbon allowances is quite a good idea. I've been a, in favour of it for 20 years or something since it's been talked about, um, because it does allow people to make the choices within the framework where they know what their social responsibility is. But I, I kind of, I, I almost feel as though, in a sense, that's putting the cart before the horse. Um, because, because first of all, we have to get a government that takes this seriously. And as we were talking about just now, we've got, you know, when you ask me what my sense of the politics is, I would say it's a very, very difficult politics because of the nature of government at the moment, the majority it has, the, the attention span that it doesn't have, and, uh, and the desire for change that, 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 it, that it actually also doesn't really have, um, honestly, if we were honestly speaking. So actually, I do think there is a kind of, you know, who is the Marcus Rashford of this movement question to be asked. And one of the things I noticed through 2019 and actually earlier this year as well, is that Extinction Rebellion has been very successful about bringing well-known people into its demonstrations. There was a, an event called Writers Rebel earlier this year, which was a really interesting, yes. you know, fantastic. Lots of well-known yeah. people all 
prepared to get out on the streets and stand up there and say, this is the change that we need. And you can be as cynical as you like about that, but it does have an impact. And I think XR, for example, at this point in time, could be a huge resource in bringing those people together and putting them in front of government in whatever way they find to do that. Because actually, you know, at the end of the day, we do have a respect for these people and they are people with a voice in society and, and politicians like to be associated with them. And that's one of the reasons why the Marcus Rashford moment happened is because actually nobody wants to be pissing off a, a famous footballer or, a, or a, you know, our favourite writer or whoever it happens to mm. be. So actually, you know, I'm, I'm kind of in favour of taking whatever measures we can to force the political attention onto this issue um, in order to to build up the base, the support base that Caroline needs to bring this bill forwards. And, and I don't think that is just celebrities. It's also, you know, us writing to our MPs. It's also perhaps us getting out on the street. It's about us talking to our employers. It's about doing whatever it takes at this point in time, creating a coalition of action from the CEE Alliance that will bring this to the attention of the politicians who have not yet yeah. signed that bill. I think almost it's like we need we need one of those things that they had during the Vote Leave campaign with a whiteboard on the wall okay. and the okay. names of every single person that they wanted to influence. And we need to go down that list, crossing them off as we bring them into the camp. It needs to be a strategic effort to bring people into this alliance. And to, and, and that's, that's the way the bills happen at the end of the day, is by getting that kind yeah. of support. It's true, yes, it is all about the force. Um, Kate, we've got a question here, which actually for you, oh, Kumi, you want to come in here, please. Yes, no, I wanted to support the ideas that have been mentioned about how to popularize the bill. Um, I think though, given the urgency of the moment that we're in, we need a multiplicity. I think Tim captured it well, but I just want to dig a little bit deeper there. I think some of the conventional things we would do in the past we need to do, like, for example, let's treat this like an election, right? Uh, let's challenge in every constituency, every Tory, all the MPs, all the party, uh, sorry, every party in the local constituency, including the local MP, to come to a meeting and let's all put everybody on the spot. If in every community, in every constituency, we put that challenge out. That would be something that I think would galvanize local action. Because part of the problem with the, with the bill process, it, 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 it kind of tends to become too national and it leaves local people out. And I think if we leave local constituency building out, we, even if the bill passes, how much of teeth it will have, how much of gumption it will have and so on will be in question. But I think there's also other things we have to do now, and Tim put his finger on it. If history teaches us anything, that when humanity has faced a major injustice or a major challenge, those struggles only move forward when decent women and men stand up and say enough is enough and no more. We prepare to go to prison if necessary. We prepare to put our lives in the line if necessary. If ever there was a time for civil disobedience to complement parliamentary action, this is it. Right? And I want to commend uh, Extinction Rebellion for what they've achieved in terms of opening up people's imagination, getting more people on, onto the streets and so on. The job is far from done yet, but there's much more needs to do. The last thing I would say is, and, and, and I hope this doesn't come out the wrong way, uh, you cannot put all your eggs in any one piece of legislation either. Right? Uh, so much as this is a very good thing that we are doing, we have to look, as people have referred to, as intersecting relationship, Rosie mentions uh, agriculture legislation and so on. We have to climatize all legislation moving forward. Right? We need to ensure that there's a climate component to every legislation. So everything, so it would be wrong to put all our eggs in a CE bill basket and let other legislation go through without us trying to climatize it. Thank you. Yes, can we? I mean, I completely agree with you. Um, but I still, in a way, I think, you know, Jonathan Porritt's question was very good about 
we all kind of know, we know it. I mean, us and probably the people that are listening to us, and you still feel this, or I do, this immense frustration as to how you move the machine. And, and I, that's why I'm, I'm really interested in, you know, the economic side of it. And in terms of just seeing some companies, whether it's, you know, big insurance companies that already, you know, they can't, they can't insure anymore. You can't insure California. You can't insure large chunks of Australia. They are hitting this crisis in a completely different way from many of us. And I think that, you know, they may, they may prove to be an incredibly important lever and I guess what I'd like to ask Kate is, is how do you think we can bring them in as, as you know, in, in real substance, which really kicks, say, the Tory politicians into seeing that unless they do something, um, you know, this, this is not 10 years away. This is what they've got to do now. Can, can that be a lever and how? You think can, can big business and the, and the economic cost be a lever? Yeah, a proper lever yeah. now. You know, none of us know what it is that makes change happen when it finally happens. We can turn around and see it. And there's always a, a multiplicity of reasons. And for some people, that business, you know, turn up in a suit and tie and tell you actually things have changed. That is for some MPs and some politicians going to be the thing that swings them. For others, people have been saying, well, where's the Marcus, Marcus Rashford of this movement? For others, it is going to be this man. I mean, if, if David Attenborough came out behind this bill, that would be phenomenal. He, he is a deeply respected voice across large swathes of this country. Uh, for other people, it's going to be their grandchildren. Um, mm -hmm. I've, I've often thought, you know, when I was working at Oxfam, we wanted to, to influence, we often thought, only half joking, the most influential campaign would to be figure out which which schools the children of the most influential politicians and business leaders go to and go and give talks at those schools so that those kids go home and say grandpa or dad because it probably is grandpa or dad what is it what is it you're doing in your business what is it and and that looking you in the eyes you cannot do this to my generation because we know that most people I mean when I talk to business leaders and who, who've had an epiphany and change and you ask them but what was it it's something very, it, it hits you here. It doesn't actually start in the wallet or in the head as a calculator. It starts here as a personal epiphany. And there's a, a, a segment of politicians who are at that age of uh, legacy that this will be how they are most impacted and most moved. So whether it's David Attenborough, whether it's the investment company saying you're no longer insurable or whether it's grandchildren saying, what are you doing in the name of our family, your moral obligation to my generation? All of them matter. And I think we have to come at it from all fronts. And yes, the people massing in the streets, it has huge impact and people say they're fed up with it and they, it's irritating, but my goodness, look at history and how it was people, the irritant mm -hmm. of mass mobilization in the street is so often the cause and the, the ingredient that brings about change. I remember being at the Copenhagen climate talks and. So sort of very strange reasons I won't go into, I ended up chairing a debate in the big town hall, which had um, Arnold Schwarzenegger on it, and he was then the governor of California. And, and uh, he turned out to be extraordinarily bright, and as you can probably imagine, quite charismatic. And he just said, you know, no, no social movement happens without the grassroots. And then, you know, went through feminism and all those things that they don't happen without all the people buying in. And I suppose, I mean, I, I like everybody else, then, you know, how can we, how can we hurry this up? And, and talking of hurrying up, we've got three minutes left. So I would like in that three minutes to bring you all back in one by one to just, you know, say, and maybe Caroline, you should start, what do you want us, in a sense, what Tim asked, but let's have a quick go round. What can we all contribute? Um, what should we do? And, you know, where do you see, I mean, politics is so much about opportunity, about seeing the partially open door, which, wherever it is, and then racing through it as fast as you can. Um, where do you see, you know, these next few months? Because it is a few months, it's not a few years. So Caroline, can I start with you? Yeah, I mean, I would say, I think that, that there are lessons from this horrible experience of COVID in the sense that governments can act in the public interest when the political will is there. And they've done things that we could never have imagined, like 
writing off 13 billion of NHS debt or, or paying the salaries of, of loads of people in the country or renationalizing rail or whatever. And I guess I would just want us to give ourselves some kind of um, hope from that, that sometimes things can happen very fast. You know, you, yes. things that you, you imagine incremental change is never gonna get us there fast enough, but sometimes there can be a tipping point and sometimes the magic money tree is found at the bottom of the garden and so forth. So that's just as a way of, of context. And, and what I want people to do, I guess, is what people have already said. I want people to lobby their MPs. And if their MPs are people who are saying, I can't act because I'm on the front bench or whatever, then challenge that. Um, if you still can't get through to your local MP, then try and organize as, as um, I think Kumi was saying, you know, some kind of local meeting in your in your constituency and, and get the MP there if you can. And, and I'm sure that, you know, throughout through the campaign, we would be happy to, to offer speakers as well if that's useful. Let's build this grassroots bottom-up campaign that Kumi spoke so eloquently about because that is where, in a sense, pressure gets brought. If we're trying to get something through Parliament, then there's 650 MPs, all of whom need to be persuaded. And don't ever think that your contacting an MP doesn't make a difference, yeah. although it might not do in the short term, it's part of that pressure that builds and can ultimately make a difference. Kumi, what would you like to leave everyone with? with the challenge. If, Mark, if we're looking for a market Rashford equivalent for climate, let me say another thing that we should look for for a climate equivalent. If taking the knee was the most powerful mm -hmm. symbolic communication that resonated with millions of people which didn't require thick policy documents and big books and so on, what would be the climate equivalent of taking a knee? Because part of the challenge we have with climate is that those of us that have been involved in it talk as if we are talking to each other all the time, right? We don't realize how big a gap of knowledge mm -hmm. by design it's been that the majority of people won't have the level of nuance that those that have the privilege of being educated or being in movements where they're working on it. So. I think for the climate bill to succeed, climate emergency bill to succeed, it must be, the approach to it needs to be popular in orientation. And I'll end with a, what might sound like a naughty idea, but if I was in the Alliance right now, what I would do is convene 100 young creative people, say some of you are gonna deliver, your job is to deliver memes creative, funny, bold memes that explodes this campaign and conversation, get some of them to develop a dance for the CE bill, get some of them to develop a song for the CE bill, because let me just tell you, we can sit here and talk till the cows come home in a language that we think everybody is talking, but let's be honest, there's not even 95% of people in the UK, who, if they watch the, or in the world, watch this conversation, would understand everything that we said. And, and politics and campaigning and mobilization is not about projecting our consciousness on the people. It's about humbling ourselves, understanding where people are, and bringing them towards us in a respectful way with dignity and integrity. Kumi, thank you. I think that's, uh, that's a really, really interesting thought. And I know at some point when we were all starting to talk about the R number, you know, people were saying, could the R number not become... Uh, like the climate, you know, that, that everyone became, you know, I'd never heard of an R number this time last year, but, you know, it feels pretty familiar to me now. Um, Tim, what would you like to leave people with? Yeah, uh, picking up on Kumi's point, I think I'd like some of those young activists, or they don't even have to be young, they could be any activists anywhere, really building out this kind of idea of a strategy. What do we need at this point in time? Yeah. We need names on the bill. And, um, and, and, and that can be a very strategic activity. You know, it, I, instead of a whiteboard, I've been watching CNN all week, of course, all last week, and looking at those wonderful tools they have, you know, looking yes. at the swing states. We need the swing politicians and we need to focus on the swing politicians. We need to go down that board name by name, bringing them in. We need to ask which does that person who signed that bill, who do they know, who do they talk to? What is their, what is their uh, circle of friends and, and collaborators? And build those names on the bill name by name. And I think that's, you know, it's a very practical, very strategic task. And we have 
this huge resource actually that has come out on the streets in the last year of young people who understand the dynamics of, of, of online and in ways in fact that you know um, the old the politics of the past doesn't necessarily understand it and that's what we should bring to this occasion that's what Caroline needs that's what the bill needs and that's what will turn it into an act I love that idea that we have a list, a parliamentary list, everything your MP has said about climate, how they voted, how many letters they've got, how they have replied to the letters, a whole sort of climate dossier and all on every single person. Great, Absolutely. let's do it. Um, I just, Kate, um, you have the final word, but just before I come to you, the, the question of the grandparents, it resonates very strongly, as you can imagine from where I am, that a lot of people, we had David Attenborough in to talk to, well, right at the beginning of Peers of the Planet, a lot of people signed up afterwards, but the thing that rings through is, what are you leaving behind you? You know, this is not so great. So what, what do you want to see that we can do? I think we've had some rather good ideas, actually. I think there have been amazing ideas. I think Kumi just totally unwittingly just appointed himself campaign manager. I mean, with yeah. all that ideas pouring out, Kumi, you ain't going nowhere. <laughs> that was amazing. Um, I love the what is the climate equivalent of take the knee um, and Tim's uh, swing states. Yep, let's get that. And I, I, I think you just invented something, Rosie, you just talked what you were just saying. So can this become a piece of legacy legislation? Can we appeal? to the legacy, the people who are beginning to think, what is the legacy of my life? Yeah. Whether it's my legacy at work, my legacy to my grandchildren, my legacy in the community of which I'm a part. This is a legacy of our generation that we will bequeath to the next. And so how could we appeal to those who are engaging in that legacy, that long-term thinking, and make this a piece of legacy legislation? And, it, and I'll say one more thing, it's an emergency and we are against climate breakdown, but we always, always must remember to articulate what we're for, with play, with joy, with the beauty of a living world, because knowing what you're for is so much more inspiring than only knowing what you're against. And that's what makes people show up with fun and with music and with dance. So let's remember what we're for, a thriving planet and thriving people. It's so possible. And as Kumi began, this is the decade in which we determined that we're gonna make it happen. Thank you. That was a fantastic note to end on. And thank you all, Caroline, Tim, Kumi and Kate. And thank you to everyone who's been listening. And thank you also to everybody who sent in fantastic questions and fantastic comments. The chat is like an entire document of uh, thoughts and ideas and people sort of, as far as I can see, meeting each other and making plots. So please keep that going. This has been recorded, so you will be able to watch it again. And I'm sure, I hope that Kate's incredibly interesting donut slides will still be accessible to study and look at. Um, I hope this is not the last of events we do like this. Um, and good luck to everybody and, you know, we can make it happen. And good night.